Hi, my name is Jason Haheim, and I'm principal timpanist of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra in New York City. Now, I'd ordinarily be playing many hours of long operas at this point of the season. But since the coronavirus pandemic has indefinitely shut down the Met, I'm incredibly grateful to get to play several months of guest principal timpani with the fantastic Seoul Philharmonic instead. I'm also thrilled to have a chance to present these two master classes on orchestral timpani auditions, a topic near and dear to me since I took 28 of them before winning the Met. I learned a lot about auditioning, timpani, musicianship, and myself over the course of those 28 auditions. And I'm eager to share some of those highlights with you in these two courses. I'll be using three commonly requested and contrasting timpani excerpts as vehicles to talk about timpani auditioning in terms of general auditioning, musical considerations, and then specifically in terms of timpani technique and strategies for presenting your best timpani self at an audition. In the first class, we'll cover Beethoven 7. In the second, we'll cover Strauss Burlesque and Schumann's New England Triptych. Across this two-part class, I'm going to use these three timpani excerpts to give you a taste of what a good preparation process might involve. Understanding that this really is just a taste and that the limited time available to us now doesn't afford a truly comprehensive investigation of these issues. Nevertheless, my goal is to give you a framework to get started. For context, here then is Beethoven 7 with full orchestra. Now, one thing worth clarifying, when I say Beethoven 7, I'm here very specifically talking about measures 89 through 111 in the first movement, one of the most commonly asked excerpts. But there are others. In fact, Beethoven 7 contains at least nine arguably askable spots throughout the symphony. And it's incumbent upon serious timpani students to consult with their teachers and as many other resources as possible to familiarize themselves with not only all of these potentially askable spots, but the entire works as a whole. And of course, this applies to all of the excerpts you'll ever see on audition lists. For now though, we're focusing on the opening. Now that you've heard the full orchestra playing this section, let's hear the timpani excerpt in isolation. Doesn't seem so hard, right? Wrong. One of the common misperceptions about timpani excerpts, and actually many instruments excerpts, is that, oh, that looks pretty easy. How hard could that be? While it's true that this excerpt contains only two pitches and straightforward rhythms, orchestral timpani excerpts are rarely about can you simply play the notes? Instead, it's about how well can you play the notes? How much control 
and finesse and nuance and overall artistry can you demonstrate with something seemingly simple but deceptively difficult? This points to the role of timpani in the orchestra and the overall musical vision we're trying to convey. I often think about the following analogy. If an entire orchestra were like a naval armada, the timpani are the aircraft carrier. They might not be the fastest or most agile vessel, but they essentially set the navigational heading for the entire fleet. As such, timpani become one of the chief agents of energy and drama. And at the best, composers knew how to deploy timpani at pivotal moments to achieve these ends. In this case, Beethoven wrote his seventh symphony incorporating popular dance forms. So much so that Wagner nicknamed the symphony the apotheosis of the dance. And drums have been fundamental to dance since the beginning of human history. The horn fanfare in the exposition of this symphony then becomes an iconic moment where the timpanist has several critical musical priorities to fulfill. Provide an energetic foundation for this joyous eruption. Maintain a rock solid steady tempo. Perform the rhythms accurately. And finally, make it dance. How do we satisfy these musical aims? And how do we communicate this to an orchestra committee? Keep in mind, audition committees will be composed of representative instruments from the entire orchestra, not just your own section. So for all instrumentalists, it's critical to play mock auditions for other people who don't play your instrument and really pay attention to their feedback. This is all the more critical for timpanists since you'll almost never have another timpanist listening to you on the committee. So really, your job in playing an audition is to be persuasive, to sonically demonstrate to your listeners that you are a complete musician, possessing excellent technique, to support compelling musical ideas. And in the context of orchestral excerpts, you want to use your brief excerpt to help paint the fuller picture. One of the greatest compliments I think any solo auditioner can receive is, wow, you know, the way you played that, I could really hear the rest of the orchestra playing in my head. That is what we want to evoke. That is where the magic happens. So how can we get to that? How can we use solo timpani in isolation to evoke that full musical portrait? It comes from great technical control of your instrument, coupled to a comprehensive understanding of the music and your role in it. And so it must begin with a solid foundation. The reason orchestra committees choose short excerpts is because these snippets of musical material have proven over time to be incredibly dense conveyors of musical information. Committees are able to discern a tremendous amount from your playing in a very short time. And the excerpts that make it onto audition lists are there because they demonstrate combinations of very specific skills. Skills you will need to be a great ensemble player and a good colleague. This points to the reality that audition committee members will be listening for a lot of different things simultaneously. In my own work as a student, 
I often found it overwhelming to try to consider all of these variables at once. So instead, I've used the following diagram to break them down for myself and my students as a way to better structure and prioritize my work. I call this structure the three-legged stool pyramid. The pyramid implies a stacked ascending ranking of priorities, whereas the three-legged stool points to another reality. On a three-legged stool, if any one leg is weak or broken, the entire structure falls over. And I believe this is true in music as well. You might spend a ton of time obsessing over your tone or your phrasing, but if you are heinously out of tune, it's not going to matter. Your structure will collapse and you will be cut from the audition. Another reality this structure tries to communicate is this. Some musical variables are objective, while others can be highly subjective. Objective elements like time, rhythm, intonation, and clarity can be measured quantitatively, and there should be little disagreement among savvy listeners about these variables. However, subjective elements like phrasing, tone, style, energy, and personality may encounter a wider range of opinion among listeners. This is all the more reason why it's essential to play for as many other people as possible who don't play your instrument in order to get their unbiased feedback, both objective and subjective. Finally, something that tends to happen as audition rounds proceed is that objective fundamental issues tend to get people cut in prelims. After that, however, since most candidates will have established solid fundamentals, the bandwidth and ears of the listening committee are now freed to pay attention to the higher levels of this structure, the elements where true artistry can really be demonstrated and revealed. I've found a structure like that to be critical in focusing my own work and that of my students. It is a continuous reminder to me of the never-ending importance of fundamentals. It reminds me that our music making is ultimately all about clear communication. We are simply vibrating air at people. But if our technique is insufficient for us to play with clarity, all of our great musical ideas will be imperceptible and unintelligible. Imagine a great orator from history, like President Barack Obama speaking at the 2004 Democratic National Convention. He was still only a senator at the time, but his idea was profound. Our common ties are stronger and more important than our differences. The thing is, even though it's a wonderful idea, the delivery also really matters. Compare these two versions. There's not a liberal America and a conservative America. There's the United States of America. Now, compare that to, <clears throat> it's not a liberal America and conservative America, it's the United States of America. Those are really different impressions you receive, right? It makes a huge difference. And for music making, our control of our fundamentals is the same as that kind of oratorical delivery. Let's make this more specific by stepping through the areas of this pyramid structure with Beethoven 7. We'll begin with intonation. 
For me, as a tympanist, it's critical that my basic setup and posture enables me to stay in tune at all times. This means my two feet are always on the two most relevant pedals for what I'm playing. Even in great orchestras, the pitch center will fluctuate. And if it happens while, for example, I'm continuously rolling, I need to be able to adjust using only my feet while my hands are busy. This can easily happen if the brass enter fortissimo, where they'll tend to be sharp, sustain over many measures, decrescendo, and then pass the line to the winds playing pianissimo, where they'll tend to be flat. So unless I adjust in real time, I'll be flat to the brass and sharp to the winds. As a consequence, this means that I always play sitting on a stool. Make sure the stool is height adjustable, since everyone will have slightly different ideal height based on the length of their legs, torso, and arms. Next, we'll cover time and rhythm. These two elements are arguably your highest priority, since drums have been responsible for these primal factors for tens of thousands of years. It's no wonder the tympanist is often called the second conductor. But it also bears clarifying, what's the difference between time and rhythm? I think it's important to have precise definitions for these, since it will affect the strategies we use to refine them. My teacher, John Tafoya, used the following excellent analogy. Picture a bicycle wheel, where the rate of rotation of the wheel is time and the spokes of the wheel are the rhythms. They're related to each other, but also independent. One can play with great time and bad rhythm. Where there, the placement of my 16th notes was inaccurate, and one can also play with great rhythm and bad time. Where there, the rate of my wheel rotation was really inconsistent. Now, great musicians obviously need both. To develop good time, start by checking out a lot of recordings and clock them with your metronome. Write these down. Calculate an average. Then maybe knock off a couple clicks. This will establish your target tempo. For me, my Beethoven 7 target tempo is dotted quarter note equals 102. You can then always refer back to this when recording yourself to make sure you're within an acceptable range of your target. Good rhythm almost always comes from an impeccable internal subdivision. You feel all the little beats, which makes it almost impossible to inaccurately play rhythms. I'll often subdivide with my hands when listening back to my recordings to assess my rhythm, like this. Slow practice can be really effective for this kind of work, to diagnose where your rhythms might not be precise, especially since rhythm is one of the main things a committee will be listening for with this excerpt. The next major issue is clarity, and its companion issue, evenness. Included with these are seemingly obvious things like attentiveness to the printed part. Is everything obviously there, like dynamics and articulations? Is anything obviously missing? Are things obviously present that shouldn't be? Evenness and consistency 
are one of the main things that tends to eliminate people with this excerpt. Instead of even playing, supporting a consistent rhythm like this, all too often, committees will hear uneven playing like this. Again, if performing music is like oratory, that was really bad delivery. Because there's no way you'll be able to hear any kind of subtle phrasing I want to do. I'll talk about strategies to refine clarity, evenness, and consistency in a moment. But while we're here, we should also integrate the idea of phrasing. When I first started playing this excerpt for teachers and friends who played other instruments, the most frequent comment was, it's not even. <sighs> so I struggled for years to be able to play this excerpt cleanly and evenly. After significant improvement, the nature of the comments changed. It's even enough but it doesn't really dance. Can it have more lilt? What? <laughs> lilt? What does that even mean? <sighs> well, after spending time considering these comments, consulting teachers, and experimenting on my own, I finally realized that what these other musicians wanted to hear was shapes within shapes. Not just a long line over four to eight measures, but a way of playing those individual rhythms so that they are shaped as well. The way I chose to achieve this is shown here, where there's essentially a microphrase in every single rhythm leading to the downbeat, like this. So, now we've arrived at the real challenges of this excerpt. First, be able to play evenly and consistently with incredible control. Second, building on that, establish your musical picture by playing shapes within shapes. How do we do that? I'll give you some ideas in a minute since it points to the overall style. But on our way there, let's talk about tone. In this excerpt, your tone is going to come from two primary places. First, selecting an appropriate mallet. And second, using great legato strokes to get the fullest, most singing sound out of the timpani. Now, Tone can be a highly subjective musical element, especially on timpani, and expectations for this appropriate tone can vary dramatically across different regions and different traditions. So without getting too far into the weeds on that, I think most timpanists would agree that Beethoven 7 requires something reasonably articulate not too hard and not too soft. So in terms of my mallet selection, I'm using a stick custom made by my collaborator, Jeff Luft. It's got a carbon fiber shaft, a wood core, and a medium layer of American felt. It's nicely articulate. More than a big fluffy stick, but without being too articulate, like this kind of stick. So, with an appropriate mallet and good legato strokes, we're well on our way to building our structure for a solid excerpt. But what do these legato strokes mean 
in terms of achieving our aims of evenness, consistency, control, and shapes within shapes? This is where it all comes together at the top of the pyramid. Your personality, your style, the X factor that distinguishes you from all the other auditioners, and a clear sense of musicianship that can navigate through all the different composers and repertoire in an idiomatically sensible way. Beethoven should sound different from Strauss, and Strauss should sound different from Schumann. Let's return then to our first major goal, playing evenly and consistently with incredible control. To best achieve this consistency, and to be best able to play these microphrases later, I opt for the sticking right, right, left. Now, I'd like you to notice something about how I'm executing my legato strokes. Pay specific attention to the stick heights, especially as I play the composite rhythm, then hand separated, and then the composite rhythm again. What's going on there? Backing up a step further, it's worth discussing my definition of the legato stroke. Basically, it's a bouncing ball. Where, just like the ball, we have a natural gravity driven down, followed by a mirror image and commensurate rebound up. So, even though I have to hold a mallet in my hand, I want my hand to be interfering as little as possible in this organic rebounding down-up motion. Once you've defined the legato stroke like that, you easily find yourself doing the kind of fundamental building block exercises that support all of your timpani playing. This simple 6-8 warm-up exercise is something I use regularly. But again, note what's happening with my stick heights. When one hand or the other has to play twice as frequently, the stick height drops by roughly half. This is because it's just like the bouncing ball, where the ball doesn't have time to rebound all the way back to its starting point, but rather is sent back down prematurely due to the needs of the tempo. Like dribbling a basketball. This all leads back to our Beethoven 7 rhythm. Executing this evenly should not result in matched stick heights. Quite the opposite. Pay attention to my right hand stick height versus my left one more time. Finally, <clears throat> once you've established the ability to play this rhythm in a perfectly even monotone, you can cut loose to employ your subtle shapes within shapes phrasing. Paying attention to stick heights once more, and ideally practicing this in front of a mirror or using video recording to check yourself, 
your right hand strokes will vary slightly between higher and lower to affect these microphrases like this. Assembling all of these pieces back together now, you get this. That might seem like a lot I threw at you in a very short amount of time. It is. Remember, none of this comes quickly or easily. And in fact, your musical personality is the amalgamation of all of the work you've ever put in. All of these small but highly considered decisions. And it cannot be artificially constructed out of nothing. It's a slow, incremental, laborious process. And you have to be okay with that. It's necessarily going to involve spending a ton of time outside the practice room with score study and both attending and listening to great musicians playing this repertoire. For me, having a hierarchical priority structure of musical elements made it easier for me to track my progress and to be specific about my practice goals and how I was planning to accomplish them. If it seems extremely rigorous and methodical, you're right. It's a way to ensure the highest quality practice time or what researcher Anders Ericsson coined deliberate practice. Defined most simply, deliberate practice is the scientific method applied to the craft of music making. And like scientists deciding which variables to focus on during their experiments, this pyramid structure clarifies those variables. Ultimately, the pyramid structure made it much more possible for me to put together a smart audition plan one spanning weeks, if not months, and in which you'll better be able to prioritize the issues that really need work instead of just cruising through material that feels good because it's already in pretty good shape. And the issues that really need work will often come back to fundamentals. Many, if not most, committee listeners will be tapping along, which points to the importance of subdivision to establish great rhythm. And again, these fundamentals are usually objective and clear cut. You're either in tune or you're not. Your tempo is either in the ballpark or it's not. Your rhythms are either accurate or they're not. I've spent enough time now on the other side of the screen listening to auditions to confirm for you the vast majority of people getting cut in prelim rounds is due to deficiencies in their fundamentals. Plain and simple. And I think this is due to another basic reality. Fundamentals are the least fun things to practice and also the hardest things to improve consistently and dramatically over time. And so, by definition, it is only a much smaller subset of auditioners, the elite contenders, who will have put in that kind of smart, dedicated work. The best players I know across a wide range of instruments share this in common. 
they've spent a huge proportion of their overall practice time on fundamentals. So, I hope I've given you some ideas for what that preparation looks like for brief timpani excerpt so that you can extrapolate and apply it to the rest of your work. Thanks for watching part one. Check out part two next, where we'll examine two other excerpts of contrasting styles, discuss the biomechanics of how I approach the technique for these excerpts, and elaborate on the absolutely critical aspect of getting constant feedback for yourself via self-recording.